Good morning, gunliners. All right, John, we're landing for you. Wow. Here it up. I gotta make it. Put something on it. Here, you can start that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Nothing, nothing. We have Martha, we have <laughs> Mom and Dad, me, Mr. Reese, and Doug, and Dan. <laughs> and service shall be starting soon for those of you who are interested. I gotta tell you, they were All right, Dad, ascend to the podium. They were walking everywhere. Yeah. Yay, Dad! Well, and I speak for all of the onliners, of course. Do you? All right. I wish. <laughs> well, we're, we're in for a blast today. Now, well, the, for, I speak for everyone but the disliker. Disliker? Yeah, I'm not sure he's disliked this yet. I'll have to look. Yeah, this one guy dislikes everything. Without even, Almost before he even starts. Oh, that's ridiculous. So he doesn't even study it before he dislikes it. So he is Mr. Cool. Pessimist. Yeah. So it's yeah. to dislike. But you know, we feel bad if he didn't dislike our stuff. <laughs> oh, we have one person watching. Yay! Yeah. It could be our disliker. We need a better name for him though. Or her. Or it. <laughs> uh, we're optimistic that they're at least somewhat normal. Okay, I think we'll start off with uh, Isaiah 118. That was in Romans. <laughs> <laughs> Romans. I'm so picky. Come and let us reason together. All right. Isaiah 118. Yeah, let's see. Isaiah 118. Let's start with that. So the verse I heard when I was very young in the Lord, and it just sort of sticks with you all your whole life. Because this is how we're going to open up Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Let's we get started. Okay. Are we all set? Yep. Okay. You're alive. Well, let's have a word of prayer to open up, and then we'll let it rip from there. Heavenly Father, we just call upon your precious name. And thank you for your love. Thank you for caring for us. Above all, Lord, thank you for reaching out and bringing your salvation to our hearts. Thank you for our repentance of our own sins, Lord, and the trust in what you did for us at the cross. Thank you for raising again from the dead, showing that all our sins were forgiven. We just uh, ask you to remember our friend who left us, Lord, and we can do adequately nothing without you according to John 15. And we just pray, Lord, to open up the scriptures, open up our hearts, and Lord, uh, may we be a blessing to those around us today. In Jesus' name we pray for your glory. Amen. Amen. Okay. Isaiah 118. Come now. We've not the uh, come now is God's favorite word. I like that phrase because in my many years as a Baptist, they don't like to reason at all. <laughs> they have no reasoning whatsoever. They just like to shoot it to hell. And uh, and I don't understand it because when we get together in front of the Lord. Uh, it's too late to reason together at that point. And there's no repentance in heaven. Repentance is only down here. Come now and let us reason and notice the word together. Let's sit down and talk it out. Say it the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet. And take note the color of sin is not black. The color of sin is red. Uh -oh. It's scarlet. And gray. No. They shall be white as okay. snow. So every time we have a winter, it's a reminder that our sins have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Fascinating. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 2. Well, hold it. What's, what's... Romans chapter 2, verse 1. 
What's, 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 yes. what's, what's, what's... Isaiah 1, 18. No, 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 no. I lost, I lost, I lost some words. Um, what's the difference between crimson, which I always thought was a red, and wool? Oh, the crimson? Wool is white and crimson is red. No. Wool is white? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, unless there's a black sheep in the back of the white. Oh, yeah. very funny. <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. There's black wool, but yeah. the biblical use is... Yeah, uh, the biblical view is white. Right. So, it can also speak of purity? Yes. Uh, purity, yes. And also, you'll see them interchange with white as snow, white as wool. Yeah, and then the take, the take of mind the snow, when it falls on the ground, Notice this connection. Snow was known to call a blanket. Yes. We have a blanket of snow. And when you look at the wool, what do we have? Clothing. Clothing for the sheep. And so when you, when you study the armor of God or you study other persons, we are, we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So I get a connection with the wool, a connection thank with the snow. You. Oh, thank you. Did you thing. say thank you? So, uh, so those are unique connections. The, the main thing I wanted to share with you out of Isaiah 118, and notice that God is calling the sinner to come into his presence. Amen. And he said to the sinner, let's sit down and let's talk it over. Amen. And I would hate to tell you this, but I've noticed even this year the increase of people that refuse to sit down and talk. No. They don't even talk, they just shoot. True. Bang. True. They do not want to talk. I, I haven't even said a word to them yet. And, and I can share with you a ton of family members that will not sit down and will not talk about the Lord. Refuse. They don't even want to know what they don't even want to know what my viewpoint is. They don't even want to know what I think. And just you're cut off and that's it. That's why I like Isaiah 118. Because he says, come now and let's talk this thing out. Let's talk it out. You know, and I'm willing to talk out almost anything. And I'll say almost anything because my dad says, only confess so far. And I will tell you, Dustin Dillon, again with Baptists, they cannot handle truth. Well, no, a good yeah. portion. I mean, the ones are, in my life. There are good Baptists. I just there are good ones, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, we're I'm looking Baptists. at this. Yeah, we're Baptists. Yeah, I'm looking yeah at we're Baptists. Right we'll handle the truth. We dropped the name, remember? Hey, we dropped the name, remember? That's true. Uh, we're hey. believers. I, I tell people we are. We're believers. We are, historically speaking, we're Baptists, and we don't. We're not and saved. I love Baptists. Oh, I, boy. I would want to be anything else. I well, just, one thing I learned early in ministry is. They've been messed with. Go ahead. Bad preachers, you know, tell me one of the ways to stay out of trouble is to not speak in sweeping terms. Correct. Don't say, that is correct. Say, uh, try to get into the habit of saying um, a lot of or most in my experience. In my, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if there's any, if there's right any good Baptists out there, let's sit down and reason and talk to you. Yeah, the vast that. majority, you're right about. I mean, yeah. we argue that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, can, I can tell you the church I was down there in Tampa. Same thing there, the one that was in Washington, same group there. And I can start naming all the different groups I was a visitor at. And the Lord says, when, when the strangers come in, be nice to them, be kind to them. Mm -hmm. And I blew in and blew out. I just, the one that really got me was, uh, and I won't mention the church name, but it's up near Sainsville. I even brought a visitor, and they could care less. I mean, there's something wrong, guys. We should have a genuine love for Christ. And the time that we spend together in our meditations with the Lord, in the book, God is sharing his love with us through every single scripture verse. He's sharing his love with us. And as he shares that love with us, our next step is what? Love one another. Christ says, if I have loved you, as I have loved you, share that with the next person. Love one another. So, if you guys have learned anything at all in your in your scriptural meditation before the Lord, feel free, feel free to share that. Because there's things I'm lacking, and I'm waiting for someone to come up and share with me something that 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 would put in that last puzzle piece. All right. And I tried to share with you some of the neat things that I find out. Like for instance, this week, my devotions right now is in the book of Jeremiah. Now, 
I already know in Revelation chapter 11, in the last days, which we're, yeah, we might be close to the last hours, okay? Amen. But, take a look in there. Jerusalem is called Sodom. Yeah. Wow. So, every other day I'm thinking to myself, what is going on in the city of Jerusalem? What, and I don't need any details, but what in the world is going on with that city? Where God says, this is Sodom. So I'm reading along in my devotions, okay, in, in the book of uh, Jeremiah, and I think it's somewhere in the 20s. Just before God brings in the Babylonian army in 606 BC, guess what he calls Jerusalem? Sodom. Now, I now have a basis for doing a comparative study. The same identical thing that's happening in Jerusalem and in Israel at the time that the Babylonian army comes in, how about that? Is being reset up again for the time when Christ comes back. Now, the big difference between the two, because I finished reading 2 Chronicles, the last chapter. Okay, when you take a look at 2 Chronicles, the last chapter, the Lord says, I'm going to try one more last ditch attempt here. I'm going to send my messengers in, and if they repent, no Babylon army. None at all. We've got something to work with. They totally refused to hear the word of God. And they made fun of the messengers, they mocked them, and kicked them out, and who knows what else they did to them. And the Lord said at that point, there's no remedy. No remedy. There's no way I can cure this. That's the same thing on cancer, guys. There's a certain stage where you cannot be cured. And no matter how much medicine, how much radiation, or whatever, it's over with. You're checking out. And ironically, along with our Roman study, in Romans 1, is that they had sodomites, uh, who were camped in uh, and living right next to the temple. Correct. And there was sodomite sex and prostitution going on all around the temple area. Yeah. Just like in the churches today. Yeah. So that's one that I think Hezekiah, when he came in to be king, one of the first things he did was kick out yeah. all the sodomites out of there. And if you kick go them out of the, the temple, kick you, them out of the area. I'm told that if you go to Jerusalem and uh, you're not with a tour group, uh, they'll tell you, don't go to certain areas because there's uh, a bad element, and that includes methamphetamines and sodomites. Yeah. Right there near where the temple will be built. Yeah. And if you compare Scripture to Scripture again, uh, in the last days, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Right. And iniquity again is connected with basically moral impurity. And that group there, once they get stuck into their moral impurity, they do not want a gospel track. You're now a uh, hate crime to them, and they will it just uh, destroy relationships. They want nothing to do with you whatsoever. It's, uh, so I thought that was fascinating. The other thing I picked up this week in my meditations was uh, Laodicean Church Age. For most of my life, or whenever they preach that, they always uh, preach about God vomiting uh, the people out of his mouth. That's the main focus is the, the, the vomit, okay? Um, because we're here at BBF Ohio, out of Matthew chapter 4, Christ, I believe, if it's not Luke, it could be Luke 4, but either one, it says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. Out of the mouth. Well, good night, guys. We know without a single doubt, the authorized King James is the Word of God. The Word of God. And he's doing what? Vomiting him out of his mouth? Since 1901, he's been vomiting the American culture out of his mouth. I think that if he had spew, it's vomit. It's, I know it's vomit. Yeah. I'm just saying. King but it, but it, spew. But the reason the King James says spew is because when you vomit, it's usually a projectile type of thing. So it's a yeah, violence. Yeah, it's a forceful vomit. <laughs> yeah, violence. It's like a violent vomit. <laughs> but yeah. I also talk about where, you know, you're either, you're either hot or you're cold. Yeah. yeah. If, if you're not, then it's real. Yeah. But that is so interesting. You know, and this is just food for thought, you guys, because my wife told me what happened here on Wednesday night dealing with Abby Winters. All right. As far as she was uh, a Baptist, is it Abby Winters for the movie Unplanned? Oh, Abby Johnson. Abby Johnson. Yeah. Okay. Well, she starts off as a Baptist since she's now a Catholic. Yep. Okay. There's something wrong with that picture. Yeah. But I'll tell you, the older I get, the more and more 
I see Baptists turning into Catholics. Yep. And there are Baptists, believe it or not, unfortunately, uh, churches in Canada that have already turned Catholic. And you don't hear those stories at all, but I've got the, some documentation out in my garage somewhere. Or I don't bother <laughs> too much, but uh, at the temple, they during the time you and I were there, there was this guy married to this very, very nice lady that was in the choir. And he did, I think he played guitar even. And he did stirring and became a Catholic. Got, got remarried and became a Catholic. You might know who that guy is. I can still see his face. I still pray for him. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still shaking on the inside. Hot wild. What is what's going on? Now, this is just food for thought. The fact that this lady becomes a Catholic. Up front, Catholics are, are anti-abortion. We're saying up front. Okay, so that's what they're known for. All right. Our group, if our group is lukewarm, okay, I'm just trying to be nice. But, yes. The thing I see a lot with Catholic, people that do turn Catholic, they don't, wanna, they don't want the conviction. They don't want the, um, there's no conviction there. There's, they're being read to, they're being told, they're not studying. Correct. Yeah, and I would agree with that because, um, and, and the one guy we talked about, there was him and some other guy, I suspect something else was happening behind the scenes. Okay? And so, uh, instead of trusting the blood of Christ, they did not take care of the problem, so they ended up going there so they don't have to face their convictions. Don't have to change. All right. A lot of it's the love of money. I don't know about Abby Johnson, but um, the president of the Evangelical Theological Society, which is supposed to be the cream of the crop of evangelicalism, his name was Francis Beckwith. This happened less than 10 years ago, but it's only been a few years ago. He resigned as the president <coughs> of the Evangelical Theological Society and announced he was joining Rome. Yeah. Really? Yeah, Francis Beckwith. I posted on a blog where he announced that and told him exactly what we're talking about. I said, Francis, you make God sick, and you are being a complete, devastating, false witness to millions of people right now. And what do you think I heard? All these milk toast evangelicals talking about how mean I was. Not about how wicked Francis Beckwith is. I mean because I told him the truth. Yeah. And the old preachers would have been a lot more harsh than I was, but we got all these little effeminate men and milk toast evangelicals who can't oh. rebuke sharply the way the Bible teaches us to. Well, you 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 may be aware of this part of it, but somewhere I think in the 1980s, Falwell came up with the five points of being an evangelical. Okay. Yeah. So if you're teaching everyone, here's the five points that you can be an evangelical on. And when you go through the five points, it would include Seventh-day Adventists, yep. it would include Jehovah Witnesses, it would include... Uh, no, the, the, the deity of Christ was one of them, so oh, it really? the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, but you're right. Seventh-day yeah. Adventists, Catholics, you Yeah, know? yeah. Because uh, in certain circles where I mention the word Catholic, it, it doesn't, there's no steering in the water. Yep. Dead. Dead in the door now. Just another denomination as yeah. far as they're concerned. Yeah, and I can't tell you how many other certain Christians I've talked to where Catholicism was looked upon as, as hey, during the, we're in the same group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys. Thank Billy Graham. Yeah. Billy Graham's one did all that. Yeah, so we don't know how we've been sabotaged down through the time frame. No one is studying church history. No one is studying the scriptures. And they're praying for revival, and my heart goes out for them. But God's not going to revive a dead book. He's not going to revive a book that 20% of the scriptures are not his. Because you wouldn't know what part is uh, that. It's like we were talking the other day. That when they say revival, they don't mean what you and I mean. No. When they say Bible, they don't mean what you and I mean. When they say yeah. the word meat, I want meat, they don't mean what you and I mean. It's exactly. They're, they're in a totally, totally different world. Totally changed. Um, uh, you might remember a certain guy that we held signs out with down on the corner. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Josh. Okay, well. Oh, very nice. I'm just going to mention any names. <laughs> well, you might have repented. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he married a, a, a certain girl that I taught in Sunday school. Oh. Oh, yeah, right. 
So I still pray for him. I still pray for the whole family. It's another interesting situation. But um, he was with another guy there. And I was, we were talking King James language a little bit. And I was trying to share it with them. In the King James, he uses the word reprove. And the reason he uses the word reprove is the word reprove means to show the error of someone else and to bring them back into fellowship. Right. Bring them back into fellowship. Amen. Guys, the newer Bibles, the word reprove is missing. And in the newer Bibles, the word um, expose. Now, you, you look at me, do you want to be exposed or do you want to be reproved? Okay? And then you go to James that says, confess your faults. Okay, your faults. What's the new Bible say? Confess your sins. Now, I'm not, I, I, um, I will tell you that. You're not, I don't care if you know what my sins are, I'm not going to confess them to you. I confess my faults to you. Okay? But I'm not, I'll lie on that than the other one. Because I've, I've seen the damage that's been done over the years. We well, do have to then also after the first and second admonition yeah you're to reject them and Romans 16 17 says to mark them yes so that's the exactly. problem with the new versions is is they're mud they're mixing things up exactly there's a place for exposing yeah but it's not why you're just preaching the word oh and that's true too which is the context right of that context. there comes a point when when the other person does not want want to repent does not want to come so that in some aspects that would be that would be held true but I've noticed in Bible basics, we, we don't even start with basics. We go to step four, step five. And we're in the muddle mess we're in where we get scared of one another. We don't share the love of Christ with one another. We're, we're scared to say anything because all the, uh, we're, we're so oppressed. You guys can know the scripture just as well as I do. I tell you, don't ever think you can't know Bible. Now, I think I hardly know nothing really. John, I think most of us, our experience is that we, it's not that people have their opinion, it is that if you take a position at all, yeah, you get, it's you like get. you're supposed to just be muddy. Mm -hmm. If you take a much. solid position on yeah. anything, if it, and it's not just, you know, how many angels can sit on the head of a pen, but it's, you know, the rapture, Israel, dispensations, oh, yeah. eternal security, the Trinity even today, but it's yeah. being thrown out the window. Yeah, it's all. It's, it's all time. <laughs> well, let's take a look at Romans chapter 2, verse 1 now. But all this is contingent in dealing with that verse. I just want to share with the heart of God. He says, come now, and let's read it together. <clears throat> so when we come to Romans 2, 1, and going on here, what is the Lord doing? Through Paul. He's saying, come, and let's reason this thing out. Let's sit down and talk it over. Take a look at verse 1 of chapter 2. Paul is saying, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Paul is trying to reason with the group here. And if you notice in here, he says, O man. Now, in this part here, we can go back, <clears throat> we can go back to, uh, uh, verse 19 of chapter 1 because that which may be that which may be known of God is manifest in them you say oh man it's already manifest in you for God has showed it unto them he's already showed it to them look at verse 20 for the visible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood being understood by the things that are made that's us, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Without excuse. And so that's why it says here, thou art inexcusable. God, he, Paul's already trying to reason with them, saying, God's already talked to you. He's already showed you, and in, in, in as far as creation, he, he's already talked to you, he's already showed it to you. You are without excuse. And because we go to verse 21, because that which... Because that, when they knew God, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So this is the group he's talking to right here. He's trying to narrow it in, saying, you guys are with that excuse. Now, just so that you and I 
think, oh yeah, he's just talking to that group. Look at that. Whosoever. Oh, good night. You know what whosoever means? <laughs> that includes us. It means whosoever. <laughs> whosoever. Whosoever. Let's get the owl going. Whoo. <laughs> I always like the story about the psychotic owl. <laughs> he was up in the tree, his eyes were big, and he was going, why? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> amen and amen. All right, here's the word. So let's take a look. The um, let's take a real quick at Romans fourteen four and ten. Uh, we're praying for the rapture okay, before we hit these verses, but we probably need these verses just as I open the course. Um. And I'm just going to mention this only for study purposes. Romans 14, 4, Paul is saying here, Who art thou that judges another man's servant? In other, in other words, you are busy by it. You should not be going around judging another man's servant. Because look what it says in here. To his own master he stands, standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be opened up, so God is able to make him stand. What study we need to have in that one. And then let's take a look at verse, um, the next one would be verse 10. And who's just talking about verse 10, talking about us again. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Now the word judge here, we're going for the word to condemn. Not to discern. We're allowed to discern and try to help people out, but this part here deals with condemning. Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All. When I look at you guys, I have to discern if I'm going to discern anything so I know how to pray to God the Father and say, Lord, how can you use me to help them out? How can I be a friend? How can I show them the love of Christ? And that should be the heart, that should be the motive. And the context is questionable matters. You know, it's like if I see you with another woman, yeah, I don't have to worry about judging you. But yeah. if I see you eating a rare steak, and I'm, my conviction is I shouldn't eat blood, and a rare steak's awful close to eating blood, then I'm, I'll leave that between you and the Lord. Yeah, because a lot of people jump in Romans 14 to excuse sin, and it's not about sin; oh. it's about questionable matters like eating meat. Oh yeah, we talk about eating meat when you get further down there. But uh, what, uh, for the first couple of years, I was verse is in verse six. That's what I'm saying, the context. Yeah, the context. Well, I remember one of the stories back when I got saved in the early, or late 70s. Uh, this guy was, uh, see what, he might have been the son of one of the churches. We won't mention which one. And uh, he decided to divorce his wife and marry a piano player. That happens all, right? all the time. All the time. And so they well, asked him about it. <laughs> they say that, but nobody wants me, so what can I say? So, if I learn to play piano, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, church. sorry, I'm sorry. That's all you say. <laughs> Rats. Yeah. Well, here's the thing: is they took the guy's side. They took the guy's side, and they. Uh, they questioned him, what in the world are you doing? It's sin before the Lord. <laughs> and he says, he goes, I know, he says, but after I can make sure, I just ask the Lord forgive me. That's just a great answer. Yeah. And Martha, guys, I never put up with that sort of thing. So yeah. No, I understand. I, I, I've not heard what the final chapter was on that marriage. Okay, but most second marriages end 60% in divorce. When you go to a third marriage, it normally ends up at 80%. All right, it just gets worse. So we don't know where Mickey Rooney was at number eight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, good for him. Towards the end of his life, he got saved, I was told. And so that was a good thing. But guys, what happens, the two things in our spirit that we cannot contain, and that's the spirit of guilt and the spirit of condemnation. Bitterness. And we can't handle those at all. If those two are not cleared up, it just brings disaster to the next relationship. So, uh, and then the other part of the verse, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Thou that judgest doest the same things. 
All right? Uh, this is God's definition for hypocrisy. What, what you do when you judge another person for, you're secretly doing it yourself behind the scenes. And uh, that is pretty deep. Um, let's take a look at Matthew 7. And you're already familiar with this anyway, 1 through 5. This comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, it shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Amen. That is it. All right. Um, and I wish we had even more time, but let's flip to, just so you know, Matthew 23. Um, a friend of mine gave me a cassette tape on Matthew 23 as a devotion in one of the Bible colleges up north. And all the guy did was read the King James Version right here of Matthew 23. And you could sense the excitement and the thrill and the amen flowing forth because they knew exactly what it was going for. The audience knew ahead of time because they knew the book. Amen. They knew the book. And that is, that is fun for any pastor or any Bible teacher to be up there and, and you know the crowd is there with you. They understand what you're going for because they're in the book. All right? The, uh, in Matthew 23 here, seven times the word hypocrite shows up. And the word hypocrisy shows up one time. The Lord has just landed on the line to this group here. He's really zapping the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, verse 1, 2, and 3 here. The, then spake Jesus to the multitude, and to his disciples, saying, the scribes, now the scribes, they had an authorized Hebrew Bible. They had an authorized Hebrew Bible right. that was available. And they did not know God when they saw him. Mm -hmm. They did not match the two. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Notice, they like power. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And it goes all the way down. There are what you call the um, uh, eight woes. There are eight woes. Through here. Sum it up and we call them hypocrites. Uh, if you want to have a good Bible study, it takes a little bit of thought and prayer, but when you go through uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, there are eight blessings. Take the eight blessings and you can match it with the eight words. Blessings, words. Uh, you'll be really enriched in the Word of God when you compare the two. And I'd rather go for the blessings than I would the woes. <laughs> I've got enough woe up in the future coming down the pike. And uh, so I just pray for the Lord's mercy. But uh, when we don't go for the eight blessings, we get the eight woes. And the eight woes comes why? Because we're having Christ. In, uh, Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minute warning. <laughs> Okay. Well, we could probably just end it on the verse there. I've got a couple other notes that we could take a look at. Um, Matthew 
that if you take a look in Romans chapter 1, the first 17 verses, uh, the emphasis is basically on Christians. And when you come down to verses 18 to 32, that's basically on the lost. So when you go into chapter 2, Paul is reflecting on the lost and their judging. And he's trying to get them to look at themselves for being a judge. Because inside their heart, they're, why are they judging? Because they're trying to follow a law. And what law are they trying to follow? And that's the same law found in, uh, since we have a minute and a half, let's go to Romans chapter 10, verse 4. <coughs> Um, yeah, verse 3. Romans 10, verse 3. For they, talk about Israel, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Whenever you have someone going about establishing their own righteousness, that's the basis they judge them for. Yep. And uh, what's happened with the changing of the laws, especially with LGBT, they have their own law now. Yep. Um, I was just informed in Westerville, they now have passed an ordinance, so you have to be nice to yep. transgenders. True. Um, the one lady that I know that's part of the Tea Party up in that area said uh, they tried getting people to come out to oppose it, and only three people showed up in the council. Three. Her, her husband, and another person. Guys, we're not going to affect or change any laws of the land if we're, if we're not, if, first of all, if we're not informed, and if we're, if we're not gathered around, had it been the Muslims, had, there, if, had they were going to be passing an ordinance against Muslims, there would have been not only no standing room in that uh, place, the parking lot would have been packed, they would have had, they'd have had tens of thousands outside the outside that place. That is what's going to happen to America because we said, well, God can take care of it. Where are we in that process? We need to be involved. And the greatest involvement you and I can have is with the gospel of Christ. And it's okay to get beat up by the people outside. Let's reason with them as much as we can. But uh, it's through the gospel we make the change. Amen. Not through the law. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your love and your tender mercies. And Lord, we know that you are wicked times we're living in. But at least on our watch, Lord, give us a victory. Uh, even here, a little over the ten. So your presence, so your strength, so your power. And this can be done through your word. This can be done through the gospel of Christ, through the shed blood. And it's going to be through us taking that word to a lost and dying world. Be merciful to us and grant us strength to do your will and work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.